Good morning and welcome to today's hearing. Almost three years have passed since the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, became law. This legislation appropriated $42.5 billion to the Broadband Equity Access and Employment BEAD program at the National Telecommunications <laughs> and Information Administration, NTIA, to deploy broadband infrastructure to unserved and underserved homes and businesses. While this investment in broadband infrastructure to rural communities is a worthy cause, I'm concerned with the implementation of the BEAD program. This program was created outside of the regular order and therefore lacks appropriate provisions to safeguard these taxpayer dollars. There was no discussion of whether $42 billion is the right amount to connect every American or debate on how this program should be administered. The infrastructure bill was also missed an opportunity to enact meaningful permitting reform that would have broken down barriers to deployment and stretched this federal funding further. Republicans on this committee have been vocal about our concern that NTAA's self-imposed guidelines for BEAD will undermine the program's success, leading to wasted tax dollars while leaving Americans without the broadband access they need to succeed in their everyday life. NTIA has spent two years pushing an expensive fiber-first agenda, violating the law's requirement to use a technology-neutral approach and making deployment cost prohibitive. And Mr. Alwan, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, uh, Chairman Morris Rogers, Subcommittee Chair Lata, Ranking Member Pallone, and uh, Ranking Subcommittee Member Mansui and members of the subcommittee. My name is Basil Alwyn, I'm CEO of Toronto Wireless. Uh, it's an honor to appear before leaders that are all committed to, you know, from diverse parts of our country and committed to solving the uh, digital divide, uh, sharing that common purpose uh, for every American. That's the mission of Toronto Wireless, a next generation fixed wireless access technology company, both founded and headquartered in the US. I don't presume everyone here knows about Toronto Wireless, so I'll weave some uh, introductory comments into my three main points uh, for my opening statement. The first message I wanted to pass along is that technology advances. Uh, this is truly the case at Toronto, a uh, pre-public company founded by a, a wireless industry veteran and three uh, immigrant PhD uh, uh, students in 2009 who had focused their PhD thesis actually on um, how to equip equip impoverished villages in Ghana with broadband service. And um, they got an A on their, on their uh, thesis and uh, started a company, which is what we do here in America. Fast forward 15 years and about 400 million of investment and uh, a privately funded R&D, and they really cracked the code on two really fundamental issues that have plagued fixed, fixed wireless in the past. The first uh, breakthrough uh, is the ability to reliably de deliver high-speed broadband non-line of sight uh, to a home or a business uh, from, from, a, from a tower. And, and the challenge here is that um, most uh, homes and businesses do not have line of sight to a tower. So you really need to be able to deliver high performance in non-line of sight conditions. Uh, there's generally either temporary or permanent obstructions in the way. Our radios tend to, are, are designed to adapt to those conditions. In fact, they recalculate the channel conditions 5,000 times every second and try to figure out what's going on to deliver that reliable broadband that feels like a, almost like a fiber-like experience in that regard. We always use the term last mile, but Toronto technology actually is, uh, goes much further than that. Uh, line of sight, we can do about a little over 20 miles. Uh, near line of sight, we do 10 to 12 miles of, of uh, transmission. And even non-line of sight, where we don't have any real direct path to a customer, we can go three to six miles, delivering really high-speed broadband. And that's really very, very key. The, te the second technology breakthrough we really kind of focused on was uh, um, interference and mitigation. So whether in license or on license spectrum, and we do both, we operate in both uh, spectrums, the ability to truly ignore radio interference, uh, which is unique and new. Uh, we call this technology uh, mouthful asynchronous burst interference cancellation, uh, which is a it's really a sophisticated type of noise cancellation, if you will. Uh, we don't um, jam other signals, rather we selectively listen. So we're very precise about how we hear conversations and, and how we send in energy. Our interference and cance cancellation technology allows us to share and use spectrum incredibly efficiently, uh, a factor of 5x over existing wireless technologies, which is really great. Uh, and it's really fundamental, actually, to delivering ultra-high-speed broadband uh, which, at homes. Homes consume about 30 to 50 times more bandwidth than a typical mobile phone. 
Our initial product, G1, has been commercially available for three years. In that short time, Toronto has grown to serve communities in 26 countries, 47 states, through about 350 internet service providers. So we're pretty widely deployed. The second message I wanted to, to share is that finances are finite. Toronto delivers high speed, low latency internet at one tenth the cost of fiber, right? And while delivering the, really a fiber class service, we are even deploying gigabit by 500 services on this technology. So we, we agree that fiber is fantastic. Uh, in fact, we depend on fiber for our backhaul. I spent my career building networks out of fiber. Yet when it's too costly, it takes too long to install, as is the case in many US communities due to topography, geography, the solution should be fiber and. Uh, it should be a combination to leverage other technologies to meet the standards. If we rely solely on one technology, we, we certainly will not get there in terms of providing broadband for all. So my third message is that uh, timely deployments matter. Our, our technology gets up in weeks or months while trenched and aerial fiber can take years. Uh, so we can help out there as well. Please allow me to close with an invitation. We've been honored to be visited by several of your districts to what we call uh, Experiencing is Believing Tours, when in about 60 minutes we can actually show you the technology. And it's been a real big success. Uh, Chair McMorris-Rogers, Chair Lada, Representative Eshu and Joyce, thank you for allowing us to provide those demos. And my invitation to the rest of you would be to uh, take us up on our offer, and we'd be happy to show, show it to you in the, in, in the real. It's, it's interesting to see. Thank you. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, clearly emphasized that the BEAD program should be technology neutral to ensure states had flexibility to connect all Americans. This direction was blatantly ignored by NTA when writing the rules for the BEAD program. More than two years later, NTI recently released guidance to states for allowing alternative technologies to be used by uh, BEAD recipients. Mr. Awan, what role should fixed wireless technologies like those offered by Hirana uh, play in closing the digital divide? Thank you, Chair Lott. Um, yes, um, first of all, I think one of the things that's most important to recognize is that this job, trying to solve the digital divide in the U.S. and, and serve 100 percent of unserved, requires a tool set, not a tool. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of situation. Uh, it's like building a house. You have to have multiple tools. So in certain cases, LEO satellites will be the right answer. In certain cases, fixed wireless will be the right answer, unlicensed and licensed. And in certain cases, certainly fiber is the right answer. The key here is, is that um, technology changes. And Tarana, the reason I'm here speaking in part is to represent that you know, when you put a program together that's going to last a number of years, you have to be flexible and adaptable to those changes to take advantage of the, of the technology that's available. This particular technology, I think, can play a very big role, and I think many of the states are finding, as they approach actual implementation of this, that the funds required to actually fiber everywhere, which was the initial hope of the goal of the, of the bill, uh, are going to fall pretty far short. And I would say that it's not just the funds to uh, build the network, but there also has to be an economic sustainability in the, in the subsequent network so that the, the companies continue, can continue to offer the service. So there's, there's I think, a, a pretty big stress coming uh, in uh, deployment of these technologies, and I think the states are going to have to avail themselves of every technology. The final thing I'll say is that wireless has now gotten to the point where we're getting beyond what a typical consumer could need. So it's, it's a service that's as good as fiber from a consumer point of view. So you can now make a choice <laughs> purely economically. NTIA recently released proposed guidance regarding alternative technologies like unlicensed fixed wireless, low, orbit, low Earth orbit satellite services. What are your thoughts on NTIA's proposed guidance that finally allows B to truly be a technology neutral program as Congress intended? Yeah, so we, we definitely welcome the, uh, pr the uh, clarification. And, and I think even more is going to be needed here because as the rubber hits the road, so to speak, I think holding on to 100 percent coverage of unserved and underserved is going to be is going to be a pretty tough road especially with some of the comments made about bidding and who's going to bid, given the, 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 the challenges of, of running the business, not just getting the funds but, and building the network, but then running the business thereafter. So I think uh, it's really important now that we recognize that um, all these te their technologies have stepped up that can deliver a, an end game broadband experience that don't require the same type of initial investment. 
really hard to service areas just don't get built out on a priority basis. And the truth is, connecting underserved areas is extremely difficult and it's not economically viable. So I think we're finding out through the bead process that a one-size-fits-all approach of just build fiber everywhere is not the right answer for everyone. You know, we're four years into the program. Uh, implementation in Florida is still quite far behind, quite honestly. Mr. Elwin. You mentioned uh, in your testimony how technology is always advancing and your company, Tarana Wireless Service, uh, customers as far as 22 miles away. I think, you know, uh, there's alternative technologies, the low Earth orbit satellite broadband services, which we all know uh, are coming and, and are growing daily. Uh, and not just one, there's several. Uh, I think that must be part of the solution to collect one, connect 100% of our remote areas, in a lot of my remote areas. Uh, NTI recently re revised their requirements around using alternative technologies in certain high-cost areas. And I wonder, do you believe the NTI has done enough to make sure that the states and the people know that they can use and sponsor these alternative technologies? And has NTI provided any support to the states or the people to navigate the programs so they can understand that? Thank you for the question. Uh, never enough. Uh, we have a long way to go here. Uh, Technology has really advanced, and even uh, even today, people still believe fiber in many cases is the only answer. It brings up permitting, workforce issues, but wireless has actually come a long way to the point where it can be a legitimate, not only a legitimate, but a peer way to offer broadband. And we need to take advantage of that. It's, it's super important. If, in fact, I, my view is I'm somewhat comforted by the fact that I think economics will rule the day. In other words, in the end, we will not be able to get 100% coverage unless we take pretty good advantage of these technologies. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'm a big fan of it. I actually own one of those uh, ground-based stations, and I can use it to compete against my home, which has got, you know, uh, is wired as well, but uh, uh, it works just fine. Uh, yeah. I do live video feeds to Ukraine constantly. I mean, it's just, so it's pretty easy. For 30 years, Republicans and Democrats on this subcommittee wringing our hands over getting broadband to everyone in our country, and that it has to be affordable. If it's not affordable, then it simply doesn't exist. Mr. Alwan, I'm proud of what you have accomplished and that what you continue to do. I find it very exciting. But I think it's very important to note that the NTA listened very hard, listened very hard. Mr. Alwan and anyone else that is in a related uh, um, technology, part of the industry, have been taken seriously by the NTIA and, uh, 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 and Alan who heads it up. Uh, would you like to come, would you maybe tell us a very short story I know where you started, but I think it's important for the record, for, for the committee's record to know uh, how the presentation was made, who came to meet with you, and that. Because, uh, you know, I mean, it, it said that, you know, the federal agencies are so far away from people, they don't know who they are, you can't get a phone call in, you can't get a meeting with them. Uh, it's a different story for Toronto. Would, would you tell us, uh, enlighten the rest of the committee, Mr. Alwan, on that? Yeah, thank you, thank you for the question, for sure. I, I mean, I, I do want to comment that the NTA has been engaging us really well. And the framework of the law was a very fiber first law when it first came yes, out. Yes, it's because a preference of the It's a preference. And, and truth be told, no. at the time it was put together, mm -hmm. that was appropriate. Mm -hmm. Technology has just advanced so much. And what I, what I do appreciate is our engagement with the NTAA and their openness to reevaluate and kind of put out new guidelines, which they have done. Uh, it's never fast enough, as I mentioned, because, you know, th things are happening right now. And I think the equation, closing that equation is going to be so difficult. But we've had a, a, a constant good interaction with the NTIA. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of good feedback. I think it's been a good two-way in, in, uh, engagement. How does um, uh, next generation uh, uh, fixed uh, wireless address the issue of um, reliability and uh, resilience? Yeah, so it's a great, it's a good question. It's, it's interesting, it, um, fiber is certainly great, but fiber is not just fiber. Sometimes aerial fiber uh, has real issues with reliability as well. The nice thing about fixed wireless or wireless in general is the medium is non-existent, it's air. 
Uh, there's no issue with crossing railroad tracks. You don't need a permit for that. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually is, is, is in, in fact, we're finding in some countries a, a strong preference for wireless over fiber in, where pl where in places where trenching happens kind of randomly and where there's not an opportunity to, to control things. So I think wireless has gotten to the point, and a big part of this is the technology we put together for managing spectrum, where it can be very reliable, very much like a wireline network, and very, very high speed. My district's very rural. Many homes are nestled away in the mountains, a lot of them in the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, beyond the sight line of the nearest tower. Uh, so how does Tarana utilize uh, Spectrum to deliver high-quality Internet uh, beyond the sight lines of its towers, and why should taxpayer dollars from the B program go towards your technology? Yeah, it's one of the great things I've experienced in my career in Silicon Valley is that things that weren't possible all of a sudden become possible with another turn of the crank, and this is one of those moments. Um, and specifically the way we just quite technical, but you can think of it as um, we – are able to, in the digital domain, reconstruct signals of, of reflections and ref, uh, diffractions, mm -hmm. refractions, and actually reconstruct a signal uh, even though it's bouncing off of all kinds of things in real time. This is a quite interesting mathematics trick, but what it results in is a non-line of sight, very highly re high reliability signal at very high speeds. And we're seeing that the demonstrations we've done, including with, with Ms. Eshu yeah. around, and around the, the, uh, the country, have really proven out that we can do non-line of sight, even through trees, at very high speeds. And the, the impact of that is the issue. And in a lower density area, that's, that's economics. Mm -hmm. That's economics. That means you can offer it to more people, a, a great service. Can you discuss the process for receiving NTIA's approval of your technology, very briefly? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, there's, there's no formal process for approving the technology. We fit into uh, what's called non-priority and alternative. So after fiber, it's automatic. If fiber is not available at the, at the correct price point, we would be uh, approved for use. Do you, do you like it that way? I think uh, if, the, if we were to do that bill now, we would put fiber and next-gen fixed wireless on the same footing. I don't think there's a reason to have a priority or any, anymore. At the time, there may have been. Times have changed. Hmm. Okay, something to consider. I would like to thank our witnesses for being here today. I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be in order. We are finished.